work is something that we all have in common. Not what our work is, but the fact that we all have work to do in this world and that we spend most of our lives doing it. We are starting a new series today and we're calling it the genesis of work. And we're asking, where did work come from and what is it all about? Some of the work we do, we are paid to do, but some of it we're not. Some of our work is connected to a certain role that we have. Some of our work we choose, some we don't. It's simply a product of the circumstances we find ourselves in. We're starting this series to explore all these realities because we think that so much of our faith in Jesus is actually expressed in what we do in this world. The place we spend most of our time is in whatever work we're putting our hand to. And if this is so, most of our discipleship to Jesus, in becoming like him, in being shaped more and more into his image by his grace, is learnt and experienced in our work. But one of the problems that many Christians experience is that they don't see, they don't understand and experience the connections between faith and work and no fault on their own part much of the time because the church on the whole has fostered this divide, I think. But it's my conviction that this is a divide we must reconcile. If we are to live into all that God has intended for us as creatures made in his image. So we're gonna spend time thinking about how we think about what our work is and how this is distinct or connected with a job we do. We'll spend time thinking about how we work out what we do for work. What's the connection between our work and our calling? What is work for, we'll ask. What is it supposed to achieve? Why is it so hard at times? And can I come to understand and experience what I'm doing as an aspect of God's work in this world? At the hinge of this series, we'll be looking at the work of Jesus as he comes to show us just how God works and what kind of work God does. The work we're talking about is how we use whatever energy we have in purposeful ways, whether we're paid for that work or not. And we want to think about this in terms of what the Bible says about work, which, and as it turns out, the Bible has a lot to say about it. We're going to run this series from now, which in the ancient church calendar is the beginning of Lent running through Easter and up to Pentecost, the giving of the Spirit. And I had to cut out things that we could have explored in the Bible because it's so full of things to teach us about work. But we're going to start today by looking at Genesis 1 and seeing the first worker in the biblical story. Because the way the first worker works and what they do informs the whole rest of the story of God that unfolds through the Scriptures. As soon as the Bible starts, it starts talking about work. Genesis 1 starts, In the beginning God created. The second word in the Hebrew text is a word that describes the work that God does. Create. And although this spiritual being, who we will come to understand as God, isn't identified until chapter 2 verse 4, this spiritual being is depicted as a worker. Before we come to learn who he is, we're told about his work and that his work is good. Which is a really important thing for us to see and understand as we come to explore this series on work because for some of us, work is this necessary evil. Work is conceived by many in our, as in our culture as a thing I have to do until I can retire and not work. It's something we, we have to do but we wish we didn't. It's something that comes with the fall a few chapters later in this story, rather than being something that is God's intent from the beginning because it is something that he does. In fact, it's the very first thing that we see him do. And apart from just wanting to point out the fact that the story of scripture starts with God working, the question I'm coming with, and I want to explore is, what is this account telling us about God's work? What kind of work is he doing here and why is he doing it? And as we come to this account of God's creation work, there's one thing that's important for us to have in mind as we approach a text like this. That is to recognize that we are approaching an ancient text here. 
that this was written at a different time in history to where we are now, in a different culture and a different context to ours. The wonder of the text, as with all Bible texts, is that it still speaks to us today where we are. But we need to recognize that because we come to this text as outsiders to the culture and worldview of those that it's written to, we naturally read it differently to the original hearers of the story. And that causes problems for us as we come to it. So what we need to try to do as we come to this account is to ask, what is the original author intending to communicate by it? And how do the people who first heard the story understand it communicating to them, what's being said to them? I say that because the tendency for many today in our culture is to read this account as a description of how God made the world. Many approach it as a story of origins of the universe and the order and timing of how God brought it into being. But if we try to read it in this way, we immediately run into problems because we've got different ideas about what the world is to those to whom this was written. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When I say heavens and earth, you likely have some pictures come to mind about what that means. When we read God created the heavens, we might say, that's a bit weird to say it in the plural because there's only one heaven really, but I can put that aside because heaven is some other spiritual realm where, where God is and where we go when we die if we've put our trust in Jesus. And the question we need to ask at this point is, is this what the original audience had in mind when they heard God created the heavens? Or think earth. When you think of the earth, you likely think of a blue planet, which is a sphere that spins on its axis and that orbits the sun. The question is, is this what the author had in mind? Or the way the original audience for whom this account is first written understood the earth? And I want to say no. Actually, their understanding of the heavens of the earth are what is described in Genesis 1 which is a different picture to heaven and earth that most people have today. This account uses their picture of the heavens and the earth, not to describe how God made it, but to communicate something else. What the author seems to be doing here is to use their understanding of how God's creation fits together to show what God is doing in creating it, to talk about his purpose in creating it. The interest of the author in this account is not about how God creates something out of nothing as a description of origins that we then examine scientifically, but about why God creates. The focus is not on the material elements of creation and the order that God made them in six days, whether literal or not, but on the functional purpose of creation and why God brings them into order in the first place. The word translated creator here, bara, in Hebrew is used about 50 times in the Hebrew scriptures. And every single time it's used as an action that God takes. God is the only one that does this action through the Hebrew scriptures. And it's an action that's usually tied to something new that God is doing. It's something that is done with a particular purpose in mind for a particular outcome or in order to function in a certain new way. Its use has less to do with making something of material substance and more to do with the functional purpose of the thing being made, whether it's material or not, and the newness of this thing that's being made with a power that comes only from God. One commentator, John Goldingay says, the emphasis of Barra lies first on the sovereignty of what God achieves rather than on the nothingness from which God starts. In Genesis 1, God simply speaks and things happen. The bringing of newness out of chaos and disorder. Some people want to read Genesis 1 as a scientific description of what God does in creation, of making our material universe out of nothing. But this isn't the kind of creating that Genesis 1 is trying to communicate. Rather than talking about God working to bring about the material substance of creation, this account is about God working to bring functional order to elements that are already there. You see this when you read verse two. 
the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 2 starts with material that is already there. The earth is there, the heavens aren't though, but without proper shape, and they're in the darkness. There's no land, but there's water. Walter Brueggemann says, Israel evidences no interest or curiosity about the origin of the stuff of creation. It is simply there as a given, which Yahweh then addresses in lordly fashion. Israel understood Yahweh's activity of creation to be one of forming, shaping, governing, ordering, and sustaining a created world out of the stuff of chaos, which was already there. In the mind of the ancient Near East, these images of darkness and formlessness and primordial waters are images of chaos and disorder. This formless void is mentioned in other places in the Old Testament in Isaiah 34, 11 or Jeremiah 4, 23, describing the desert or the wilderness. It's a place where nothing is productive. This story, the author is saying, is about how this spiritual being, Yahweh, gave meaning and wholeness to an empty, meaningless, dark, watery void, so that what was unproductive became productive and purposeful. And it's into this chaos and darkness and emptiness and disorder that God, by his calm and commanding initiative, simply speaks to bring about order, and a place that will be fit for his intended purposes. And this ordering of a place that's fit for his purposes is described then over six periods of time. So in verse three to five, what does he first do? He says there should be light, which he sees as good. And then he bundles light and darkness into their own periods. What's he doing here? He's making the function of time, mediated by the periods of darkness and light. And then these periods of dark and light are used to describe the rest of his creation work as he brings order to the chaos. The period of light, called day, brings order, which is good. It helps to make a world, a world a functional place for his purposes. And there's evening and there's morning, the first day. Next, he says there should be an expanse. That is, he makes a space above those initial primordial waters, which, which is our sky. And the waters that fall from the sky, the rain, they're all gathered above the sky. And the, the waters in the sea stay below. And he called that expanse, the area where the waters above fall to the waters below, the heavens. On their second day, he's developed a system of weather, which helps make the world a functional place for his purposes. And there's evening and morning, the second day. Next, he gathers the waters below to one place. He makes the sea. So there's the sea gathered into one place, which makes a dry place. And that dry place, called earth. And he saw that it was good. Why? Somehow this helps to achieve the purpose for his creation. Then plants and trees grow up from the earth, which is good. Why? This is making the world a functional place for his purposes. It's, it's food. And then there's evening and morning, the third day. Then on the fourth day, he makes lights in the heavens. One bright one for the day and a lesser one for the night that are etched into the spinning dome of the heavens and creates a rhythm of life to mark birthdays and sacred festivals and seasons and years. And this is good. Why? Because it helps to order things for his purposes in creation. The fifth day, he speaks of sea creatures and birds and they come to being to fly across the expanse of the heavens. And he sees them as good, and he tells them to multiply and cover the earth. On the sixth day, God speaks forth animals from the earth, and he sees that they're good. They're made according to the purposes that he has for them. And then finally, the, the spiritual beings say, okay, we're, we're making one more creature, but this creature's different. And we'll spend more time looking at this difference next week. But let me just read through what he says here, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, after our likeness, 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. On every other day, God has said that the order that he's brought about is good. But on this sixth day, it is very good. Because this account is communicating that at the pinnacle of God's creative work in bringing about order from chaos is the formation of humans who are made in his image and with a special task to do, which is really what this series is all about. But the thing I want us to notice in the way this account unfolds as a description of God's purposes in the world is that it emphasizes humans and suggests that what God had in mind in bringing order to this place was for it to be a place where humans could dwell. Some people hear this and say, you're making humans the center of the story. Well, no, God is the main player in this story. He's the first worker. He's the one who makes things new. He's the one who does the impossible in bringing order out to the chaos. But this account of what he does emphasizes the place of humans in his functional purposes for the world. And we see why at the end of the account on the seventh day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. What is this seventh day about? It is about God resting in his good order. Having finished this new work of bringing order to the chaos, God stops his work. He's shaped things in such a way to make them functional for his purpose of sustaining life. And he stops to rest. But it's not as if he's resting because he's tired from all his work of creating. Even though Sabbath is the final day in this account of God's creative work, it's not the pinnacle of his creation as if the reason for God making the world is to rest from making it. Stopping work is part of his process of creation in the world. And in this, he sets a model for our weekly rhythm of work too. But the rest from work is not the purpose behind his creation. Rather, this rest is a picture of God taking up residence in the creation that he has made. John Walton says, the picture being formed here in the minds of the ancient hearers is, is that God has built the earth as his temple that is fit for him to dwell in with his creation and in which humankind has a special role to play as priests in his world. The idea this is communicating is that his purpose has been to fashion a place where his creation can flourish and he can dwell with it. His purpose has been to create sacred space that's fit for God to rest or reside in with his creation, to be a place where he can take up his rule. And how will he do that? He'll do it in the work that he does in the world, working alongside the creatures that he has made, because the genesis of work, where it originated, is God himself. In the beginning, God worked. Work is not something that God makes humans do, but is beneath God himself. God is described as a working God before we even know who he is. From the beginning, God works for the joy of it, 
to see the good of what he makes and shape a place fit for purpose, for life to thrive, for him to be with and to enjoy his creation. Notice the refrain that runs throughout this working week. That at the end of each day, as God stands back and he looks at the work that he's done, he sees that work and he says, this is good. I don't know if you've ever had one of those experiences where you're working on something and you're, you're deep into it. And then you look at the time, and you're like, whoa, where did the time go? Because there's, you've been so focused, there's so much enjoyment in what you're doing. And I get this sense that this is what it's like for God as he's forming creation. This first worker finds joy in what he does and takes pleasure in seeing the work of his hands. And this is my prayer for us as we turn ourselves to this God who does a kind of new work that only he can do. That his creative power would enable your productive and purposeful work in his world. And that you would learn as one of his people amongst us as his people to work in reflection of him. And that as you work in this world that he has formed for his purposes, that you would find joy in what you do.